Guten Abend. Uh, I am so honored. I think that the real performance just occurred this evening. Uh, I am honored to be presented by such distinguished luminaries. Uh, I've just heard about them and I found a little bit about their history, and I am humbled by being presented by you. Thank you so much. Um, Pippa, Heidi, and Ziggy, Leo, the staff of the Globe Arts team met me today at the airport. I'd never met them before. And they enfolded me. They took me in. They brought me home. I met the President Mueller a little while ago, and his warmth extended that reach. And it seems as as if everybody in Vienna wants to be friendly to me. <laughs> I, I'm just thrilled. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm a fourth grade teacher. I teach nine-year-olds and 10-year-olds. This is the primary grade. I teach in a little school in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia in the southeastern United States. It's about two and a half hours from Washington, D.C. And I've been quietly teaching in my classroom, as all of my colleagues do, for many years. Um, but I came to realize that everything I do in my classroom, everything we do, we're standing on the shoulders of someone else. Other people have made it possible for us to be here. I'm not here alone, I've said before. There are other people who have made sacrifices and special effort just so that I could be. And I'm always in honor of them and mentioning that whenever we start. We all have lineages. We all have people who've helped us become. I don't think I've ever met a self-made man, really. It seems that everyone has a team of support around them in their lives. And in my case, this film uh, there was a film made, a documentary film called World Peace and Other Fourth Grade Achievements by a young filmmaker in Charlottesville, Virginia. He was an independent filmmaker, which meant he had no money. But he came to me and said, let's make a movie. And I was a small town school teacher and I said, yes. And so with no funds whatsoever, we started to make a movie. And this movie was about this geopolitical simulation, I'll tell you about it, called The World Peace Game. We thought we would share it with our friends in his living room. We thought it would be a small success if we were lucky. This film has now uh, gone around the world. Uh, it was well received in Europe, I'm, I'm happy to say. And at the Bergen International Film Festival, this particular film, even though I'm in it, it was given the number one award, the audience award. And we were astounded. It was a film about teachers and education. Usually, you know, you have to have a car chase or some explosions. But we didn't have any of that, not really. And this film seemed to have a great success. So I'm, I'm deeply indebted to Chris Farina, a visionary artist. You put the arts together with education, you have a great combination. And I'm also indebted to the Martin Institute for Teaching Excellence in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, Jamie Baker, Brad Martin, and the, public, the uh, Presbyterian Day School. They offered us a partnership, the World Peace Game to extend what I was doing into the world, and that's why I'm also able to be here today. So I wanted to just extend the thanks and again share that I'm standing on the shoulders of so many others to be here. I'm not alone. And the way this got started, this game, this world peace game, which was explained so beautifully, I understand more about it now than I thought I did before, and I've been doing it for 34 years. It was so beautifully explained uh, it started when, when I got my first job. I went to the interview for teaching. I wanted to be a teacher, and the supervisor had the interview with me, and it went well, I thought. And at the end, she said, all right, you have the job. I'm teaching, you'll be teaching gifted children, elementary school and high school. And it's my first job, and I, I was a little uh, uncertain, so I said, well, what do I do if I get this job? How, how do I do this? And I expected her to give me a manual. 
I expected her to tell me what the mandate was, what the policy was, what the instructions were, how I am to do this. How is it done? She would tell me, I thought. But what she did shocked me. What she did disturbed me so greatly that it upset everything I was to do for the next 30 years. Instead of telling me what to do, she asked me a question. She said, what do you want to do? Now, to be a young, idealistic, full of fire teacher and to be asked what you want to do in the world, what greater question could she have posed to me? So with that excitement, that blank, empty space, when there was nothing, there was no mandate, she gave me an empty space. She said, create something. And out of that emptiness, this world peace game came about. And a key component of it is emptiness, or the space allowed children to create their own solutions. I don't have to preach. I hardly have to teach. I simply developed a large structure. We call it a meta structure, an uber structure, you might say, for the children to discern what is right and good themselves. I don't have to teach compassion. I don't have to teach kindness. I would like to, but the structure is the teacher, and they teach themselves through learning by trial and error, by doing what is best, not just for themselves, but for everyone. This World Peace Game has two goals. One is all 50 of the interlocking global problems must be solved in order for the game to be won. There are problems like ethnic and religious and minority rights problems and issues, refugees, displaced homeless persons, chemical and nuclear waste spills, water rights problems, aquifer, farming and land disputes, desertification. We have breakaway republics, fossil fuels and pollution. Of course, climate change is there, endangered species. Everything I could think that was in the world, I put into this game. You know, a lot of people think you should take it easy on children. Be very gentle and give them one or two problems at a time and you test them. And I had the opposite belief. Because I had seen them, I believed in their creativity and spontaneity and their deep wisdom, actually. So he said, let's give them everything. Let's go for it. Let's offer them all we can. So the problems are immensely complex. I cannot solve them. I invented a game that I myself don't know how to win. And I leave it up to the collective wisdom of the children to find a way. And for over 30 years now, they have saved the world again and again. They have a, an un, undefeatable will to do good. I don't quite understand this. Maybe, Father, you can help me understand, but they just will not, they will not give in to doing things wrong, wrongly and leaving people out. So it's a wonderful thing. And this film and the game itself has led us to uh, even more positive hope because the film has been shown in the United Nations now. Uh, we were invited there, Chris Farina, myself, and Jamie Baker, and we went and showed the film, and the policy people there got it. They really understood this game is not about war or warfare. It's about going through the most negative, difficult things and coming out the other side. And on top of that, I was uh, screening the film in California, and a lady walked up to me and she handed me her card. She said, Mr. Hunter, we'd like to see you. And the card said, Defense Department Pentagon. <laughs> yes, ma'am, I'll make room in my schedule for that. <laughs> I'll be sure to be there. Well, it turns out uh, Beth Flores, a policy specialist at the Pentagon, the film had been screened at the Pentagon, we found out later, a number of times. You know, we use Sun Tzu's The Art of War. The fourth graders read it. The nine-year-olds do. They use it as a guide to helping them understand how to get out of problems before they uh, uh, become larger or to avoid them altogether. And so we were invited to the Pentagon. Chris and I went. We had an amazingly deep discussion with generals and policy experts, and they were essentially saying, we'd like to avoid doing warfare so much. Can you help us think about it? Just imagine, I'm an elementary school teacher. They're asking an elementary school teacher <laughs> to help think about this. 
I said, well, I, I'm not sure I have the wisdom to do this. I mean, you've got all these wonderful, smart people here. We went back home, got a phone call about a week later. He said, Mr. Hunter, we'd like for you to bring your students to the Pentagon. We'd like to talk to them about how they achieve peace in the face of all these complex problems. And sure enough, on March 20th, 23 of my students boarded a bus. We went to Northern Virginia. We got out and went through multiple layers of security <laughs> in our suits. And we were dressed like policy experts with our lanyards on. We looked really good. <laughs> and we indeed met and discussed policy with generals, <laughs> policy experts, and the defense secretary, Mr. Leon Panetta himself, who is supposed to spend only 10 minutes with us, gave the students almost a half an hour of his time, not for a photo opportunity, but to discuss policy. He said, how do you handle climate change? Here's what we do. How do you handle insurgencies and attacks? And the students answered him because they had to deal with that in the World Peace Game. And they had, they had such a great time. They had a thrill. The children were children. They were having a great time jumping about and answering questions. And we had trained how to answer respectfully and so forth. But who can imagine the impact that meeting had, not only on the children, but upon some of the most powerful military figures in the world? This is what happened to us. And I'm a small town school teacher. So I tell my colleagues, be ready. Anything could happen. You never know. I want to talk uh, tonight a little bit about the theme of teaching for tomorrow. Uh, this is an almost impossible job. How do you as an educator prepare your students for something they're going to face in 10, 20, 30 years? And there's no way you can know what that is. You will not know what it looks like. You may not be here to see it. Yet you are charged with preparing them to handle this in such a way that it will do us all some good. I learned very early on that content, just teaching content methods and techniques as they were taught yesterday, no longer work very well. There's certainly plenty good of, in tradition and in history and things we have learned, but for things we cannot see coming, there is limited, there's a limited usefulness there. So somehow I had to figure out, we have to figure out, how do we teach children to handle things that don't exist, that we don't know are coming? And so what I tried to do was give them a sort of a toolkit. I guess I would call it a mental toolkit in my classroom. The first tool is self-reflection, knowing yourself. You go into a situation, but if you don't know who you're bringing with you, you may get in your own way. And in order to do that, I had to practice it myself. I have to review my own practice and behavior before I go to teach. What kind of baggage, what kind of prejudices, what kind of biases am I bringing in that I might not even be aware of that inhibits student learning? So I have to continually practice doing this. And I fail often. But it's a dedicated practice, and I know it must be done. So I ask the students to engage in that practice also. We also ask them to think about how to assess their results. You know, assessment is sort of a big uh, buzzword in education, at least in America right now. How do we know we have learned what we thought we were learning? How can we determine this? And of course, you all know that tests have been the traditional way of doing this. And there's such a fever pitch about testing now, I imagine in Europe as well, that uh, it's difficult to determine what the real results are. We're not sure the tests do give us the results we want. So I follow the dictum that my good friend Jay McTie, an educational consultant, talks about. He believes tests or any kind of activity is just a snapshot of a student's behavior and understanding at that moment. He said, let's go for the photo album. Let's get the entire picture out in front of us, not only in front of teachers, but let's get it in front of students. Let's let students develop self-evident assessment so that they can know and see every step along the way where they are and how they're doing. There's no surprise at the end of the test when they got a low grade and are shocked how that happened. They've been developing and watching and testing and measuring all along themselves along with the teacher. We call it self-evident assessment. 
And the, t the students I actually asked to develop this rubric with me. They develop a, a device to measure their learning themselves with me. I give you little examples very quick, but it's really interesting. We have a map. I call it a thinking map. I ask the students to draw icons or write about the stages they went through in their mind as they developed a solution for a problem. And they've got beautiful little hand-drawn iconic maps and so forth. We do this maybe 20, 30, 40 times a year for different projects. At the end of the year, the students have a beautiful encyclopedia of their thinking. They really have a mirror of how their mind works. It's very simple. But then the real interesting thing happens. They start to trade maps with each other. Let me see how you're thinking. Oh, I think I want to try the way you do that. Your mind works very differently than mine. So that kind of self-evident assessment piece is very helpful, having students know where they are and seeing what they're doing. Another tool in this toolkit is I call it the cultural nuance chart. And this is when you invite somebody from a culture you don't know very well to come and speak with you. You have your cultural nuance chart, and it has details on it like, please tell me, in a friendly way, how far apart should people stand in your culture when they meet? Should I look in the eyes or not? Does gender matter when I look at a person when I'm meeting them for the first time? What is the proper greeting? Who are three or four or five of the most important people in your culture who drive the culture in a way, the ideals? Um, uh, who is the, what's the family hierarchy? Is grandmother the power behind the scene? Or is uh, the cousin who speaks English very well and no one else in the family does? By asking these questions in an open, honest, friendly way, inviting the person to share with you the understanding, you're much more able to make contact with parents and children in schools and anyone really. I'm reminded of the time I was um, standing in the hallway in my school and this elderly man came almost running up to me. He, he thought that I really liked his grandson. He thought I was a favorite of his grandson. So he ran up to me. He grabbed my hands and he wouldn't let them go. And he said, Mr. Hunter, I want to talk to you. Now, he comes from a culture where garlic is a big staple of the diet. And he's very close. They also stand very close in this culture. So because I had done the cultural nuance chart, I knew that was okay. He could stand very close and I mustn't back up. I should stay right there and endure the garlic. And he was holding my hand and we were standing two men in the hall holding hands and I must stay with him and hold his hand. And he said, Mr. Hunter, we should go to the principal's office and tell him the good news about my son's grades. So we turned and we walked, he and I, hand in hand, to the office, swinging hands. So Understanding made that possible for me. <laughs> Had I not understand, I might have faced fear. But this, this tool of the cultural nuance chart of getting inside of another one's culture, another person's culture, and understanding from a non-adversarial point, just asking innocent questions, inviting them in to show you how it's done, makes such a difference in your classroom. Teachers sometimes in schools I, I have, I visit, use it as kind of a cheat sheet for parent conferences. Okay, I have a Korean family coming in. The first thing I'm going to say is, so tell me about your eldest son. Because you know that's the right thing to, to ask. It's a good thing to ask. You also find out what the taboo subjects are, what not to talk about as well on the chart. That's another tool. And finally, the third tool I'll share with you, and there are many tools, is to be a good teacher, to have a successful school. It depends upon visionary, confident, trusting leadership. You know, we often criticize our leaders. You know, we have uh, not a lot of patience with them if they don't get things right, right away. In my school, I have a principal. Her name is Michelle Delgallo Kastner. And she's like an angel. Looks like a model. She's an angel. She's the head of the school. And every year, about the middle of the year, she'll come down to the, the school grades and have a big meeting of all the teachers. And she'll say, let's look at all the grades, the midterm grades, and see how we are doing. And you know, in midterm, things are not so good usually. Some years are kind of dismal. We look at all the scores on the screen on the wall and it's kind of a sadness in the room, we're a little afraid. And then she stands up and she has her moment. She has her mountaintop moment. She says, I'm not worried about you. I'm not worried about the children because I know you. I trust you. I chose each one of you for this job. We're in this together and I believe in you 
So do what you can, do what you will, do what you must, and help these children get through. And every year at the end of the year, the scores are through the roof. Her <laughs> yeah. It's She supports us, and uh, she had me to understand that a leader is really a servant. If you're a leader, you are actually serving. You have a greater responsibility to serve than anyone else. You've got to be an example for it. Sometimes you're leading from the front. Sometimes you're leading from the side. Sometimes from the rear. Sometimes you have to turn over the power. But leadership and teaching and all those professions, those noble professions, you're serving, it's a service you do. And with that kind of attitude, it's a much different approach you would take to teaching in school. My boss's boss, Ms. Del, Cas Del Gallo Kastner's boss, Ms. Pam Rand, my superintendent, she's one of those high-tech superintendents. She tweets, she blogs, she Facebooks, but she, she does all that stuff on the, in the cyber realm. She's doing it all the time. She's in contact with everybody always, all the time. But she also comes around to the school and she has her smartphone with her, and she'll pull up pictures from different classrooms she's been to, and she says, look what they're doing in this classroom, an innovation. And she'll take a picture of some innovation she sees here, and she'll go around the district sharing innovations, sort of like what we have in America, the Johnny Appleseed character who casts seeds here and there. She makes it her business to make sure she shares innovation wherever she sees it. And it's, it's a remarkable thing to have your superior come, not only to support you, but to boost your work by giving you greater breadth and greater examples and greater tools to work with. And um, also with the leaders in our school, there's another part we mustn't forget. I, I thought I'd forgotten. When I was in college, uh, I had a teacher who said, so who are the most important people in school? He asked the undergraduate class. And we said, well, we got this one. Uh, it's the principal, of course. He said, no, it's not. Not the head? No. Ah, the assistant, the power behind the throne. Nope, wrong again. The other teachers, secretly, no. Superintendent, no. We could not figure out who the most important people in the school were. And after he stumped us, he told us, he said, you know, when you go into a school, you have your first job. You have to make sure that you are good friends, respectful and kind and considerate of the secretaries, the cooks, the bus drivers, the custodians, the teaching assistant, the school nurse, the counselors. Because your life and your livelihood depends upon the relationships you have with those people. The, le the least among us, we sometimes say, and they are just as much a valuable part of that whole institution as anyone in the building. So we have to make sure we include everyone in that dynamic. And finally, I'll just share with you uh, a couple of short stories, I won't keep you long, um, that sort of illustrate this idea about teaching for tomorrow. I think stories are good because they're like skins of an onion, you know, layers of the story can reveal, peel off and reveal themselves over time. You might forget me, you might forget this night, you might forget everything I said, but the stories you might be able to keep, they seem to stay longer. and they can change meaning and interpretation over time. They can give you a deeper meaning as you go through time. So I'll just share these stories. This gentleman, I'll call him Terry. A uh, story about Terry. I was giving a talk at a university, in my hometown actually, Virginia Commonwealth University, uh, a few months ago. And this elderly man stood up in the back of the room. He said, Mr. Hunter, do you remember me? I said, no, I don't think so. I'm Terry. I was in your first World Peace Game class in 1978. And I thought to myself, now if he looks like an elderly man, what does that make me? <laughs> that was 34 years ago and he's got gray. Anyway, he stood up and spoke passionately about his experience in the World Peace Game. We've since through social media gotten letters back from other students who played 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago had the most amazing things to say, but this particular incident, Terry stood up and talked about it. Later on, he went home and he Skyped me. He, you know, he used social media and the, the video camera. And he said, Mr. Hunter, I want to show you something. He said, 34 years ago, you made an offhand remark 
in our World Peace Game class was positive, and you made a gesture about it. It had such an impact on me that I went into educational policy reform in Washington, D.C. as a career many years ago. That gesture and that offhand remark, you don't even remember you did it. He said, I want you to see something. We're on Skype on the camera. And he opens the door, and this beautiful, elegant young woman walks in. He says, this is my daughter. She's successful in her career. You know why? Because I taught her that gesture, that offhand remark you made that day. And he said, wait a minute, I'm going to show you something else. In walks this wonderful little sunny boy. He's five or six years old. He said, Mr. Turner, I taught my grandson that gesture, that offhand remark you made 34 years ago. And it struck me like a bolt of lightning that everything you do is important. An offhand remark, a gesture even, decades ago, has now gone through decades forward into two, three generations. It just made me, it gave me chills because I realized how responsible I have to be. I mean, I try to be aware every moment and that self-reflection helps. That's the best I can do, but it's so important to do that. And it can happen in any field, in any profession. It just happened to be that it was in a classroom with me. So that impact was brought home to me. And my last story is about Chad. Some of you may have heard about this before, but it also il illustrates this idea of how to deal with the future that you can't prepare for. I was teaching seventh and eighth grade in Maryland, uh, in, the, in the U.S., and things were going along fine. I had a class of uh, eighth graders who were doing a literary magazine. The month was April. They were closing in on the end of the school year. Not much time left. And they had a, worked very hard on this magazine. It was funny, it was snarky, it was silly, it was very eighth grade. And I thought it was okay, I looked it over. But they had to submit it to the school head before it was published. There wasn't much time to do revisions. There's no time to really turn this around. We had to get an okay. So they submitted it on a Thursday afternoon to the head. And before they left, about 3 or 3.30 that afternoon, a letter came back from the head's office saying, this is awful. There's no way this will be published. I'm embarrassed and outraged that such innuendo, slang, such uh, put-downs of administrators, I mean, it was all in fun what they were doing, could be even written. This magazine will never see the light of day and I'm going to throw it away. This is what she said. She's very, she's very mean-spirited. And the children went home crushed. You know, they got on their buses and went home. I didn't know what to do. The next morning I come in and I'm unlocking my door to the homeroom, the classroom. I go inside and just as I step in I hear this roar out in the hall. Slamming of lockers, slamming of books, yelling and screaming. And I stick my head out of the door, I wonder what's going on and I see this mob of students coming down the hall furious and they're headed to the office. Mostly it's the literary staff, <laughs> most of my children. And I know what's going to happen. You know what's going to happen. Suspensions, expulsions, it's not going to be very nice at all. And I did not know what to do as a teacher. It's a relatively new teacher. I've got to do something. I stepped out in the hall and I used the one tool every teacher has, my relationship with them. And I called out to the ringleader who I had a great relationship with. And I said, Chad, where, where are you going? What's going on? And trying to put a happy face on things. And he said, we're going down to the office. We're going to tell Ms. so We're going to give her a piece of our mind. We're going to straighten this out. This is not going to stand. And you know that, that the fury of a testosterone-filled 13-year-old boy, it's not, it's not something you want to be around very often. So anyway, I did, not knowing what to do, I said, well, that's okay. You're going to do that. I can't really stop you. There's too many of you. How about this? Would you just come in for a minute? I want to show you something about that uh, literary magazine that might help. And they fell for it. They believed me. I don't know why. But they came in and I did something illegal. I locked the door behind them and stood against them. I said, now we're going to talk about this. We're not going anywhere until we figure this out. There was screaming and ranting and books slammed in my room. And it took about an hour. But we hammered out a solution. We came up with a civil letter that we would send to the principal expressing our dismay at her decision 
and they asked them for a reconsideration. And then I released them to class. Now, in that school, middle school, if you release students an hour late, it upsets the entire school schedule. So they go to class, they get in trouble, some of them are suspended. I'm called to the office. The principal says to me, Mr. Hunter, I'm going to terminate your contract. You're no longer going to be a teacher. And if I have anything to do about it, you will never teach in this state again. Devastation. I was shocked. I, I had no words. I went home that night with a wife and a young baby at home and tried to explain that it looks like I'm going to lose my career. I tried to do something I thought was the right thing, and it didn't work out very well. Fortunately, they had a shortage of teachers and had to hang on to me until the summer. It was only a month or so away. And that, over that summer, I looked for another job. I, I was so stung by that, I looked for another job in another state. And I actually moved to the neighboring state, Virginia, and left that situation entirely and taught elementary school for 10 years, quietly, just keeping my head down. One day I got a call from the University of Maryland, which is the university in the state I just left. I had no affiliation with them whatsoever. And the caller said, Mr. Hunter, you've just won a prize. I said, who is this? This is some kind of email phone scam or something, isn't it? No, it's really the University of Maryland. We want you to come and collect a prize. You've been nominated for an award by a former student for being his best teacher mentor. And we have a free lunch. And you say, free lunch to teachers? I say, OK, well, I'll come. <laughs> they say, we'll send a car for you. I said, sure you will. I'll come. I'll drive myself. It's not that far. So I drove up expecting some you know, sort of silly little ceremony or something and the free lunch. And as I pull into the parking lot of the university, there were limousines everywhere. I found out that teachers, there were 25 teachers nominated by 25 students in this university as their one master teacher mentor. And the university was honoring all 25, and they were scattered to the wind, so they flew in one from Indonesia. The university flew in one from Germany. No questions asked, no expenses spared. And so all 25 was gathered in this immense hall, white linen tablecloth, silverware, china, the entire board of visitors and the director and the president of the university all at a table at the front, sprays of flowers like this everywhere. And it was an amazing thing. I was honored. It was actually a true award. I was touched. And there's Chad, right beside me with his goatee and his suit, looking very grown up and happy to see me. But that's not the interesting thing. The interesting thing is part of this award was a partial scholarship to the university given to each of those teachers, given to their districts for some student that we did not know in our district to attend the university because of our award. So in essence, because I didn't know what to do and had the worst possible day ever and almost lost my career, 10 years later, hundreds of miles away, some child I did not even know has a chance to go to college. You never know the effect you have. You do something good, it has effects like a stone dropped into a pond, the ripples go out. So far, you may never see the end of them. But I've seen it every day in teaching, there is an effect. And I know from my students calling back, the assessment is over a lifetime. The assessment is not one test. The assessment is decades long. And that helps me to feel very optimistic. The students you saw here tonight, that gives me so much optimism. I saw those kids come up and I thought, this is going to turn out OK. They cared enough to do this and to tell you what they thought, and they are asking you to listen and respond. I think we can do that. So I'll close with just what I'm going to do when I leave here. <laughs> when I leave here, I'm going to go back to school and teach. I'm still teaching fourth grade, and I do this thing called bus duty. It's when the buses come and the parents come in the evening or the morning and they drop off kids or pick up kids. So I'm out there in the morning, and I'm opening car doors in the parent lane. And every time a little child hops out, I say, there's one more chance for greatness right there. It's just something I started saying. And every car door, there's another chance for greatness. Sometimes you open the minivan, there's 17 chances for greatness. Here they come. So, and it struck me all of a sudden that, what if they really are? 
What if each child, any single child, could be the one who develops a cure for cancer? If any child there maybe comes up with a solution to the problem of AIDS or poverty or famine, war, any one child could have that kind of possibility. We've got 700 children in my school. They speak 23 different languages. So that's 700 chances for greatness every day. How many schools do we have in our state? Virginia. How many schools do we have in the US? How many schools do we have in Europe? How many schools do we have in the world? How many chances for greatness do we have every day? And that's why I'm so optimistic. And that's why I can, because I couldn't before I realized it, that's why I can accept this award, because I can accept it on behalf of my students, my colleagues, my mother, who is my fourth grade teacher, and all those teachers and mentors whose shoulders I'm standing on tonight. So thank you so much, and I accept it on behalf of all of us. Thank you.